talk to John Rose, president of Opasco, and he'll discuss some of the challenges that independent telcos face. Is broadband kind of the uh, PSTN of the 1930s? Is broadband today that same kind of? Well, I believe so, project? and uh, I'll refer to Rob Reardon. He, he talked about personalizing the customer. I believe that with broadband, the customer takes control of the network. All the intelligence is in, in your broadband and your applications and your software, and the customer manipulates those mm -hmm. and, does, and does the job on that. And as far as cable, uh, cable gives you channels uh, with the uh, internet, in IPTV, the customer has has more choices, and they can choose their video. And the companies, and if you have a weak channel, maybe they get on the internet and do a better job of it and reduce their costs. But I, I think uh, even cable companies, the the lineup of uh, channels is going to change, I believe, in the future. Sure. Yeah, I was just at a, a trade show and uh, with some cable industry leaders, and you know they're dabbling in IPTV over their cable modems yeah. as an alternative way to. Uh, to get their content. I, I think the cable guys are facing what the telco guys are, have already faced through uh, uh, voice over IP. Mm -hmm. And the customer takes the control, as Rob said. Yeah, the video advantages of the world. That's I guess, right. right? Yeah. Video advantages. Yeah. I, I guess Opasco members are kind of in a unique position because a lot of them are broadband video providers as well. I mean, they provide cable TV services via coax, they provide it via IPTV, they do everything. Well, our, uh, our members are. Uh, Lex first, the local exchange telephone companies first. Uh, a good 50% of them are wireless. I, I think another 50% are into video, whether it's cable TV or IP TV or the triple play. Uh, they're into uh, C like I believe getting uh, content uh, at favorable prices. That guys pay maybe 30% more than the big guys. John, could you elaborate and maybe shed some light on tying together topics like net neutrality and telcos becoming more than a just a pipe and offering some of the services that would make them be something more than just a pipe for other services going through their network. What we're talking about here, we add an extra thing of how do you get ad revenues. And the uh, cable TV channels, you know, I love the history channels. Uh, however, the last half an hour you're probably watching 15 to 20 minutes of ads and 10 minutes of content. And the customer doesn't like that. I don't like that. However, what Google does is when you're looking for something very specific, you got your choice here and you got on the other side the ads. And I like that because it gives me a choice. I'm not forced to watch four or five commercials in a row like on the History Channel. I hate that. Well, the ads are also very relevant with Google, right? Well, they I actually know. add they, value to the content. Because they do they, because you're looking for something specific, they give it to you, but they also say you can go over to these guys and they'll sell it to you. And I, and I think that works. Yeah. And I think with you talking about the iTunes and putting that stuff on, on the internet and then attaching an ad, a relevant ad to it, I think that's a better way. Okay. When we provide broadband service and we're going to make some money off of content and all that, we have to be as good as the Googles in the world. We can't figure a way to make the customer choose us because we're going to slow something down or do some oddball. We have to compete with the Googles. We don't want to be just pipe providers, but on the other hand, whatever the customer wants to come through that pipe, we have to compete with that and we have to do a good job. Local content's good and we have to make that good enough the customer watches it. We can't restrict something so we put ours at the head of the line. It's really about adding value then, isn't you, it? You add value and in the customer, if he chooses your value, you hit a home run. Yeah. But if you don't choose, you figure something else out. Well, John, I really appreciate your time. With that was us quick. View. And, uh, and then my, my, my lead on to that is then be just be if you're just the pipe. If you're selling, if you're selling DSL service or broadband. Hi, this is Ken Pyle with VOD TV. Today we're uh, have the pleasure of talking to John Rose, president of Opasco. And John, I want to ask you um, about net neutrality. Uh, six months ago, when we met at the homestead, we discussed it a little bit. And you just uh, talked a, a little bit about it and gave an interesting perspective on where it stands versus uh, some other topics. Well, I think the change. I think it's two or three things have changed. One, uh, the control of Congress is now in the hands of the Democrat, and they viewed passing that neutrality more important than the Republicans did. The second thing at the FCC, with the approval of the uh, AT&T Bell South merger, uh, AT&T agreed. I think it was two and a half years or 30 months of what's so-called fifth principle, that they wouldn't offer any, uh, you know, offer any special services where somebody has to pay for faster speeds and all that. So I think with the four net neutrality principles that the FCC already passed in that one, we're moving closer to net neutrality now without legislation. I think in, the, in any event, I think uh, Congress will address that issue 
my guess is that probably nothing will pass this year. I think there are much more important things on the agenda, particularly Iraq. So, uh, yeah, net neutrality uh, in the big scheme of things uh, isn't really about life and death. Uh, That's right. Yeah. I think the first hundred hours that the Democrats are planning, I I'm not sure telecom's on that list, or at least as far down that list. Well, what about some of the other uh, issues that um, I know we'll be hearing about in the next couple of days, uh, things like, you know, just the access to content. Um, you know, that's a, a real challenge for rural providers to get the same kind of access that the um, bigger companies have. That, that's been one of our goals all along to get uh, to pay for content. We pay maybe 30 percent more on the average than the big guys do, and we need to get that down to the same level. Uh, and we're working that issue. I'm not sure how that will work, but we're working that issue. I think in addition to that, uh, PASCO's two biggest issues, as always, is universal service and intercarry compensation on the Missoula plan. And both of those issues, I think, are going to be uh, addressed regulatory at the FCC and maybe not at Congress this year. And do those start to address kind of this whole idea of broadband being a universal service? I know if I took broadband away from my family, they would be uh, yelling at me immediately. And it's become almost kind of the next level of service. Isn't well, it? I, I think it's more than that. I think it's the next level or it's the now level of commerce in this country. And I think rural areas need to have access to it, just like everybody else, same speeds, same everything, so that they can be, uh, you know, on par with everybody for commerce. I mean, when I come here, you know, you make your airline uh, reservations on the Internet, you get your boarding pass on the Internet. Um, two days before I came, I ordered my computer on the Internet, new one for home. So it's, it's commerce, and I think it has to be universal uh, broadband. Well, and when we uh, transmit this up to the Internet, uh, this video we're, we're showing here, it will be transmitted wirelessly. And that brings up a whole other topic, this whole idea of, uh, you know, wireless as an infrastructure, as either a complement or alternative to getting to that last mile. And, you know, how do the Opasco members see wireless, and, and how does Opasco see wireless? I, I personally see it as a complement. I think, uh, you know, we're getting to uh, download bigger and bigger files, more movies, uh, upgrades to Vista. I guess there'll be a bunch of those. I think we need more and more bandwidth, 25 meg, 50 meg. We need the MPEG-4. And I think that primarily is landline. I think we'll use uh, WiMAX and other wireless to fill in. I see it more complementary rather than a replacement. In fact, both we, we want both mobility, we want both bandwidth, and I think we need both in that Do you think uh, we'll see some movement as far as, you know, creating some of these smaller trading areas for bandwidth to make it easier for smaller players to, to be involved and have I, I, I certainly hope so. I, I don't have any insight how we do that, but I certainly hope so. Yeah. Well, John, I appreciate your time here, this kind of ad hoc uh, interview. I, if you have any closing comments... Uh, uh, the only one I say is great down here in Florida. It's not like the ice in the Midwest, and uh, we're having a good convention here. It's warm, and we've got a lot of great speakers. Well, thank you. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. <laughs> thank you. We're very privileged to uh, speak to John Rose, president of Opasco. John, I was uh, asked earlier in the year by, uh, by, a large, by an economist uh, who said, why is there a need for all the independent telcos? Can you address that? That's a very interesting question. I, we can start out. There used to be 5,000 independent companies in 1950, and we're down to probably less than 1,000 now. But the question is uh, economies of scale. And I think for some industries, uh, economies of scale work. I mean, in others, I think smaller companies best serve, particularly for rural areas. I think the smaller company in rural area gives the customer a much better uh, choice of services, much better service. He lives in the community. In addition to that, I think uh, rural areas need telecommunications, and uh, the small companies have a record of providing better. They provide broadband, but they're better uh, than the large telcos. And, uh, you know, you can argue with economists. Uh, you know, and they're, all, and, they're all, and they're all over the place. I mean, one says big. There's an economist who wrote a book called Small is Beautiful. I think it was a guy named E.F. Shoemaker or uh, something like that. Uh, but you can look at an example of construction companies. There's a lot of very large construction companies that um, build bridges and um, buildings and everything. And really, they don't have that many assets. They uh, sub everything out to subcontractors, and that's the old make-buy decision. And I think the opportunity for small companies to buy things or rent things to make their operations more efficient is greater than, than it's ever been. Uh, so I don't, I don't believe the economist who says, well, they 
you know, everything's got to be bigger. I think there has to be a mix, and I think small companies are a good part of that mix. Well, one of the other things that uh, we talked about last year and that has continued to be in the news is the whole idea of network neutrality, and it's um, and independent telcos kind of face that same challenge, don't they? Yeah, they do. I think our greatest challenge is we need access to the Internet backbone. We need good transport to get there. And we need to be able to access at, at a price that's equivalent to what the uh, big companies access them themselves. I think, I think access to Internet backbone on, on equal terms, conditions, and prices is imperative. And I think we need to do that. That's a fundamental issue. I think access to content is a fundamental issue, and that's what you guys are all about that we need to be able to contact the same prices, terms, and conditions as anybody else, the big guys. And I think those are two key areas uh, that we need access to. If you take the issue of network neutrality to a bigger level, uh, I think the network providers are going to have to give an equal shot at people using the network and themselves. An example of that would be uh, Microsoft Windows, uh, Word, and Excel, uh, the uh, Windows is the operating system, and everybody uses that more or less. And, but people can compete with Word or Excel, and they do. So I think, uh, and, and there, there shouldn't be any discrimination there, and it shouldn't be any discrimination in the Internet or the backbone networks. So the telco is kind of the operating system, if you will. Oh, yeah, they're the operating system, and uh, our small guys don't have the big, big networks like they do, and we need to be able to have uh, value-added service as well, but we need that access to that basic backbone. And on the other hand, the network providers need to be able to make their networks uh, efficient, they need to manage them, and at the same time, they need to be non-discriminatory. And that's, a, that's like standing on the edge of a knife, so it's hard to do. <laughs> One of the things uh, in this month's roundtable, there was an article about the idea of uh, telcos forming coalitions together, and they're doing that. There's obviously uh, quite a few consortiums that uh, share fiber resources and so forth, but where do you see that in the future as far as, you know, consortiums, and, and what is the role of the telco in the future? I, I, I see uh, consortiums. I see fiber getting together. I see sharing head ends. I also see network alliances, and one of APASCO's missions is that we want to be able to, uh, you know, maybe work with Microsoft or work with some other uh, uh, provider of, of TV that we can make alliances with and maybe, I mean, uh, maybe they can provide a lot of backroom uh, uh, services that we can, uh, guys can use and make it cheaper and maybe we can do things on the customer end. But I think we need strategic alliances, we need partnerships as the ones you mentioned and we need to be able to figure out ways, what, what, are, what are the best ways to uh, do business? Do you make the product, do you buy the product, or maybe you do a little of both. But I think alliances, partnerships are, are key, very key. So helping uh, independent telcos help their customers That's right. move into the 21st century. That's right. so, great. Well, John, thank you very much thank for your you. time. Appreciate it. This is Ken with VOD TV. I'm very uh, honored and pleased to uh, be here with John Rose, the uh, president of Opasco, and uh, we're going to talk to him about a few of the things going on. I guess the big thing right now is election season, and what does that mean um, in terms of telecom? Do you see much happening in 2008? Uh, legislatively, I, I see not much at all happening. I think at the FCC, uh, we, we had the joint boards made its recommendation. I think there are a couple other things floating around the FCC, and I think they'll put all this out in a docket for comment. Now, whether they resolve it in 2008, it's a real question. I, I know that Congress and Chairman Martin are at odds on each other, and that may slow down some of this stuff. But I, I feel that we will be working on those dockets, but I don't see any resolution in 2008. And Congress, I think they're too busy with elections to take up telecom. Well, I guess one of the other big telecom developments is the whole wireless auctions, and something that happened last week was Frontline bowing out of the auction process. You know, what kind of impact do you see on independent telcos uh, of that decision? Uh, uh, a PASCO and Frontline, uh, the, uh, Frontline came to our board. We discussed, the board discussed it, and we heard their proposal. However, I, I personally didn't see a, uh, Frontline had a business plan that would be successful. I think them bearing out, I don't think that has much of an effect upon our members. I think what has more of an effect is the Sprint Nextel uh, uh, Clearwire, you know, they've decided not to pursue WiMAX as much as they have in the past, and I'm not sure the financial people, I think they put pressure on, on Sprint on that. 
And that has a bigger effect on that. And, and it also might have a, an effect on uh, WiMAC's future in this country. WiMAC is pretty entrenched or done well in Europe, but I, I, you know, it remains to be seen how it's done here. I think that's a bigger issue than the frontline issue. Well, and one of the things, you know, getting to WiMAX, I, I, one of the things we talked about is the competitiveness of a WiMAX offering versus, say, a, a telco's uh, offering in, in the long term. Maybe you can expound on that. I, I think uh, Sprint, as well as the, uh, the investors in Sprint and the financial people, they, you know, WiMAX for Sprint is, is more on a mobile. I think they wanted to use it to compete against AT&T and Verizon. Uh, however, WiMAX is a point-to-point -point technology we can use to be compete against uh, landline. However, I think as the need for more and more speeds and bandwidth for the customer goes up, I'm not sure WiMAX has a future there either. It remains to be seen. I think WiMAX only have a niche market, but I, you know, I'm skeptical about the overall market. And maybe I differ from other people on that, but you know, the marketplace will decide a lot of that. Yeah, I guess it remains to be seen, doesn't it? Well, and I, we'll hear more on uh, from your opening comments. Is that right? Yeah, I'll, I'm going to talk about broadband and speeds and issues in my opening comments. Well, I mean, my total comments. So, Great. Well, John, thank you very much for thank your time. You. Thank you. And I enjoy these interviews. Thank Thanks. you very much. I felt the need to walk the walk or do the talk. We're here at the El Pasco Summer 2009 Convention uh, with John Rose. And John, one of the things you talked about today was the importance of, of shifting the association from a PSTN to an IP-based association. What's really cool is you're actually doing this at your home. You're leading the effort by example. And why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've done at your home in Williamsburg. Okay, I decided uh, about four or five months ago that I could not talk the talk without walking the walk. So my son-in-law is an engineer and we got together and we put together, and I have a diagram here, and uh, we put together a system in my home where we get about 20 channels off the air. We have a 10 megabyte uh, broadband system. We have the heat TVs hooked up to it. We get Hulu and the other off the air stuff. And we do not have a channel uh, set up. We just get broadband and off the air. And I pay, you know, the $35 a month for broadband. That's all I pay. Now, the stuff in the house offers a challenge to our members, and it also offers an opportunity. I think putting this together in the house, I could have never done it without my sound and I couldn't even start it. And that's where the telephone uh, business can have an opportunity to get in the person's house, uh, address the upscale customer. And for those companies that don't have a cable TV or a video play, this can be their cable uh, this can be their video play, and you can help them get over the top video. And, and then, uh, you know, with the, the digital TV transition, TV over the air is now much better than it was. And I'm, my house is 35 miles from Norfolk, Virginia, and 50, uh, 45 miles from Richmond. Perfect channels, HD quality. And the setup in the house works really good. It takes everything on your computer and puts it on a 52-inch screen. The quality of the stuff, like Hulu and stuff you get over the Internet now, it's not as good as HD quality, but it's close. And, you, and the real challenge for all this was uh, we, instead of using uh, set-top boxes or a Hulu-type box or a Roku box, we took PCs and put together on the PC the software necessary. In other words, we took a Windows uh, Media, a Vista Media Center player, we kind of upgraded the codecs on it. We put DVD or, or Blu-ray uh, software so we could play those, and they play wonderfully well. And then we have to work on the uh, Adobe uh, Flash Player to get the better quality there, and I think Adobe's going to come out with something in that. So, I mean, the software in that box and figuring to make that box work was a real challenge. That is an opportunity for the telephone company to get in people's homes and help them do that, particularly if they don't have a video play. But I think the customer is going to be in charge of this. The customer is going to want, you know, they don't exactly want a channel lineup. They want their own, uh, what should I say, boutique TV. So for me, I don't like all the premium channels because I'd like to watch older stuff. So we have a big Western Digital 8 terabyte box where I store DVDs and stuff off the air on so we can watch pretty much what we want to watch and when we subscribe to premium channels we didn't really watch it enough so we decided we were going to 
do away with that and come up with better stuff over the internet. Now, I don't know if that explains it, but that's the shot at it. And here's the diagram. Well, yeah, one of the interesting things you brought up in your uh, conversation this morning was the whole idea of the telco actually getting into the CPE business. And it sounds like this is kind of the uh, driver of that oh, sort yeah. of... I, I think the telco has to be provide the TV sets, provide the... Um, uh, the uh, maybe computers provide the maintenance. Maybe we can think of ways to do this through uh, uh, the fiber cloud or some other type of uh, cloud computing. But I think the customer would love to have somebody like the telephone company. Maybe you pay them a monthly fee. Maybe you do this that says, "Okay, I can take care of your network." These networks are complex, but they. But I believe they believe the customer wants them. And if the telephone company can really supply this stuff to them, I think they got a golden opportunity. If they don't take the opportunity, maybe the customer goes somewhere else. But I think it's an opportunity to be in the house. If you're in the house and supply all this stuff, they're going to take your broadband. And they'll probably take any other services you want to package with it that suits them. And, and I guess the big $98 question is, how does the spouse react to uh, this kind of service? Well, I, I can speak for my spouse. Uh, she likes watching... Uh, uh, all types of mysteries from the 1980s. She thinks in, in CIS and those are all too violent. So she watches uh, these uh, movies and we've got them on DVD and we got them, we watch that. As far as working uh, all the equipment, I think it's easy enough, but right now my, our granddaughter helps us a lot working it. So, um, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a Windows PC media center and if you know Windows, this system becomes more intuitive. I prefer the, the having the wireless keyboard over than the uh, the remote because the wireless keyboard is more in intuitive and it's up on the screen so you can know what to do. Uh, but she loves it and she's looking forward to working more with it. Well, John, I appreciate your time, your thoughts. This dovetails very well into what you said three years ago here at Opasco. So thanks. Thank you. We're at the Opasco Summer Convention. We're very privileged to have uh, John Rose, who's the president of Opasco, with us. Uh, John, um, one of the uh, segments we had on VOD TV and the Hotel Channel here was um, about uh, uh, Intel and their vision. And they said, you know, today the bare minimum is 10 megabits to, you know, really create a connected home smart TV experience. And I know you have some opinions on this, so I'd like to hear them. Well, you know, the FCC has decided it's 100 megabit to 100 million people. And you know a standard now four megabit, and uh, to the as a minimum standard to the other 30 million by 2020. So that's 10 years from now. So if you take 100 meg, divided by four meg, and do a ratio of say 1.5, that low amount we have today, mm -hmm. that relegates a, that comes up with 60k or dollar. So in my opinion, if we have 100 meg for a urban areas and four meg but rural areas 10 years from now which you're effectively telling rural areas we're going to give you a dial up yeah uh, that's and, and that's a very significant statement it comes up to 60k or which is real close to 56 dollars so i mean the ra the 25 to 1 ratio is so bad that it relegates rural areas to dial up that's interesting dial up of the 2020 period that's right that's right 10 years down the road, I mean, 4 megabit is bad enough today. It really doesn't work today. It particularly doesn't work, to, you know, in the, in the FCC's broadband plan, they laid a lot of good goals and what the nation should do. 4 megabit doesn't accomplish those goals today. So what do you think is going to happen in 2020? Yeah, the last no, time, 20, yeah, 2020. Tw and, you know, the last time Opasco was here in Seattle it was 15 years ago. It was before deregulation, um, and it was even before DSL. I mean, we we're still talking, I think, about 28 kilobits modems then, and and now you can't even imagine what that would be like. That's right. That what, what were we were doing uh, ISDN. Remember that was yeah. 56 or something like that. That was that was talked about significantly 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I mean. This idea of 10 years, I mean, just think what 10 years is. I mean, it's a, 10 years is pre-9-11. Yeah. So, I mean, 10 years is a long time in the new digital world. And to say we're going to do 4 megabits 10 years from now, that's really not a vision. It's not forward-looking. It's really not a plan. And that was one of the things I think we've heard. Um, you know this plan. It sounds like it's more of a, um, of, a, 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 not a blueprint, but quite kind of a pre, a preliminary 
plan uh, is what we heard this morning. I, I, I don't even think it's that. I think uh, this morning at the uh, broadband panel, they talked about $300 billion. I think that number is way high. I think people like Corning Glass and others, they're going to come up with something, I'm assuming, less than a third of that. Right. Less than a third of that. Well, and the other thing, too, is you have to factor in that a lot of these homes are already served by copper of some sort, I would imagine. So, you know, if you do overlashing technology and so forth, that would reduce the cost significantly. I, I think so, too. I, I just think, I, I still don't know where the 300 came from, and uh, we haven't been able to look at it. And th that's not the only problem with some of their studies. I mean, the other studies uh, between wireless and wireline, you know, they, in the telephone world, we're used to doing busy hour things, and we had to really plug into that stuff. And we have a small percentage of uh, a lot of our people that use a, a large uh, percent of the capacity. Somehow, in some of those F FCC studies, they dropped out that percentage of uh, like the 10 percent of the largest cups. Customers that use like 60 some percent of the network, somehow that didn't get in. So I think that really skewed the results away from a landline fiber type thing or even DSL type thing. Yeah, because the oversubscription, if you're, all you're relying on is an oversubscribed service, you suddenly get a busy tile tone, right? Yeah, not only that, shared service, uh, if you have a shared service, which wireless is, mm -hmm. uh, cable modems right now are shared service. If you have a shared service, the advertised speeds and the obtained speeds is a very big difference for DSL and fiber. Generally, uh, the speeds are pretty advertised and the actual speeds are pretty close. The middle mile can do some of the things that and all kinds of other things. But for a shared service like wireless, it's a huge difference between you know, your advertised speeds and your attained speeds, particularly in a, in a busy app. Well, and the other thing, too, is the, um, I, I heard from one independent telco the importance of, that they play in just interconnecting these existing wireless sites. Without them, there is no wireless. That's right. You've got to have the backhaul. You've got to have the middle of the mile. I mean, wireless and wireline are very much connected networks. You need both of them, and you need a different standard. You know, you should have a wireline standard, a wireless standard, and, that, you know, and I think rural areas needs both. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and if there's one kind of over, or overarching theme, it's the importance of kind of unifying, but also getting the message back to Washington, back to the FCC, back to Congress, and so forth about what's going on. Exactly right. If we were willing to step up as a country to the interstate highway system in the 50s, shouldn't we be willing to step up to wire this country of fiber? Is wiring fiber any less important than building the interstate highway system? You know, after World War II, we, we passed the GI Bill, which sent a, a whole lot of people to college. It turned out to be a really productive thing. Are we going to backslide on the stuff as a company, if, as a country? If so, shame on us. Well, John, it remain, you know, I guess we'll see in six months okay. what progress has been made, but I appreciate, as always, your time and uh, appreciate being here at the show. Well, thank you. We enjoy having you. Thanks. You know. See you later. Okay. Hi, this is Ken with VOD TV. We're at the IP Possibilities Conference here in Kansas City, and we have the privilege of speaking with John Rose, uh, president of Opasco. John, um, what's been going on these days? Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your view of the world in terms of uh, what you've been doing with the FCC and the National Broadband Plan? Well, that's been Opasco's major focus. Uh, we're working with the uh, industry group, uh, and we are preparing to uh, file comments this week on the, on the uh, broadband plan and uh, it, it, you know, it, this is the primary issue and uh, we're trying to work with uh, fixing intercarry compensation, making sure we get enough sufficient USF to keep our businesses to build broadband and uh, we've been meeting with the rest of the industry you know, once a month, sometimes twice a month and you know, that's been our major focus. Well, it seems like um, you're now starting to really get into the nuts and bolts of things. Last year, it was still a lot about stimulus, and uh, now you're really starting to talk about things like intercarrier compensation and so forth. Right. This year, we're actually submitting a plan, and uh, you know, last year around this time, you know, they, uh, the broadband plan that came out was a lot of questions. There's been a lot of NPRMs at the FCC since then, and. Um, so, yeah, you're right. It's focused on that, and we're focused on getting a plan together. They talk about implementing this thing, uh, not implementing, but having some sort of order out by August, and you know, then uh, implementation and transition after that. 
And one of the things, uh, and it's topic of the panel you're on, but um, broadband. Uh, in July, uh, a big talk at the conference, the convention, the summer convention, was the whole four megabits for rural, hundred megabits. Do you see any change in that in terms of how the FCC is defining broadband? Uh, no, they, they're still sticking with their four megabits, even though we put together studies and everything to show that that's not adequate. Some of their studies are not right. But we have to work within the context of they got a fixed amount of money and we have to figure out how we can use that money so that we can maintain what we have in, in rural areas now and, in fact, increase the, uh, what we have there now. But we, now they're not going to go any higher than four and one for us right now. Okay, that's interesting. They're not moving there. But what about some of the other areas? Uh, do, are you seeing some flexibility? Uh, yes, we're seeing some flexibility. We've been over there a lot of ex partes with the FCC, a lot of talks with them. They've been out in the industry. I think they better understand the industry now. I think they better understand the networks. I think they better understand some of the things they want to do. However, and this is a big however, you know, we got to see what they come out with and uh, we got to see what all the comments from other people are. And we're trying to work with other people outside of our industry. and. Uh, to see what we can come up with and um, you know as, as far as them moving specifically I, you know I don't really have anything that I can push right now they move but we, we sense they they're more they understand us better they understand the issues better we're trying to work with in the context of what they want to do and what their goals are well uh, so broadband better broadband uh, what does that mean <laughs> That's a real good question. Uh, to me, it means more speeds, but uh, the panel this morning is going to be, I think, concentrating more on that. You know, better broadband means better content, and that's, uh, you know, to me, video content. It's better access to information, uh, and uh, it's, it's the customer experience when he goes online with his uh, computer to what he gets and how fast and what he wants to use it for. So, I mean, I, I, I think if you talk to another 10 people here, they'll probably have a different way of looking at it. What sort of questions are you going to have for your uh, panelists? And you have some really good panelists there. Well, I, I got them written down. You have to come in and wait and see. Okay. <laughs> well, by the, by the time this airs on VOD TV, we'll have uh, seen that. But uh, I look forward to uh, hearing your questions and, and the responses. Right. So. Well, I appreciate it. I'm going to get in there shortly. Okay, well, John, thank you very much. It's really great to see you. Thank you. Thanks.